today I'm going to talk a bit more about using Lego trains and um, using actor systems. And I will do that together with my colleague who will do the second part of the presentation. Um, but of course, you always need a disclaimer. Although no Lego was harmed because you can easily rebuild it, we did harm a couple of Raspberry Pis, but yeah, who cares? There are lots of them. Um, so this is more or less the contents of today. If you have any questions in between, feel free to interrupt us. We will just try and answer the questions directly. That's no problem. Uh, first of all, I mean, why did we start with it? Except that it's of course fun to play with Lego and combine that with a bit of Raspberry Pis. Um, we were also wanted to invest if we could use the same languages, tooling, and frameworks that we were, that we were using to build applications for big servers for in our case, financial institutions or, or government and institutions. If you could use that same software on IoT hardware like a Raspberry Pi. So more or less investigate if you could run a Java or a Scala application on a Raspberry Pi um, without suffering too much of the performance issues. And it's also a, a nice and easy way, at least we believe it's a nice and easy way, to explain certain topics in a bit more um, simple way. So for instance, if I talk to my wife and I try to explain her what event-driven architecture is and I tell her, okay, it's when you send message from system X to system Y, then probably she would have stopped listening at event-driven somewhere. And that's not her fault, that's more our fault of having like a really strange alien dialect as developers. Um, but if I tell her like I send an event to the, to the train and then the speaker will play a song, I mean that's more easy to comprehend for people who don't have the development background. So it also makes it a bit easier to explain stuff and it makes it nice and visual. Um, in case you want to do this yourself at home, uh, it's perfectly possible. Uh, you need a Raspberry Pi, but probably lots of you already have some uh, somewhere a Raspberry Pi collecting dust uh, on a shelf. Um, so then you don't even need it and you only need a couple of things, uh, a Wi-Fi dongle, uh, a battery pack and an infrared transmitter. And why you need that, you will see that in a couple of slides. But you could also do like a lot more than that. For instance, this one has a live camera, which is a Raspberry Pi camera uh, streaming a full HD video, uh, a speaker, and an RFID reader to determine the position on the track. So you can keep adding and adding stuff to it and then make it more fun even to play with. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, when we started, we built the entire thing uh, with Java applications. So we had an Angular front-end with a REST interface here for the Java. And this was running on our laptop, so these two applications. This application was running on the Raspberry Pi on the train, and this was running on uh, the Raspberry Pi for the switches. We didn't brought the switches because they're a bit hard to set up and, and tear down. So because of the time, it's uh, a bit easier to leave them at home. Um, so we just do REST calls between those applications and then make sure the train starts moving or the switch uh, is bending. Uh, other than that, we used some standard applications that we already found, for instance, in C or in Python, and we adjusted them a little bit. And uh, that way, we could use Java as an integration layer. And for the low-level like hardware work that we were doing, we were still using C libraries or Python libraries, so we didn't have to write it ourselves. Um, OK, so how is it physically connected? At the beginning, we had everything just with Wi-Fi, because that's easy. You don't need any cables. For instance, the camera here. There was uh, just a Wi-Fi uh, dongle on board. Um, we were using Wi-Fi for the laptop. But then when we were at a conference, it was horrible because you have lots of Wi-Fi access points and you lose connections and everything. So later we ended up more or less putting everything on a wire, which is logically wireable. I mean, you could also do a wire to the train, but that looks a bit silly if you have to hold the wire up uh, above it. Um, and from the router which we have, uh, we just connect to the Raspberry Pi on the train, and that Raspberry Pi will then use the infrared transmitter to control the infrared receiver that's connected to the train, but also to a Ferris wheel, which we also have, but it's a bit hard to bring in an airplane. And after a while, you end up with lots of stuff, more or less. I mean, this is just a subset of the stuff we ended up with. My room is currently full of Lego and Raspberry Pis. So that's, that's kind of fun. Um, so how does it work originally? I mean, maybe you know the older Lego trains, they were powered by the track, so you didn't need any batteries or something like that. With the new ones, you do need some batteries um, because they don't get any power from the track. And it, it works more or less the same as this Wally. So you have an infrared receiver at the back, that one. 
and there is a battery pack inside it. This one, it's the same as that's in the train. And there are some engines at the bottom that are then used to control Wally. And we can then, if Wally works with us, we can drive around with it. So this is the same stuff more or less as what we use for the trains. But if we now have a bit of a bigger distance like this, it doesn't work anymore because infrared is only working for a short distance. That was one of the reasons that we thought of using Wi-Fi dongles on the train. So as long as we have any Wi-Fi connection, we can still use the trains. So I could also use the trains when I'm at work, of course, only during lunch breaks, and then just control them from my phone or from my computer at work. So that's really nice. That way you can just keep on running with them. And it looks like this. So this is a small Wi-Fi dongle. And this is an infrared transmitter, which is then just sending infrared signals to the train and controlling them. Uh, we also needed sound, of course. You mean you need train sounds if you have a train. Um, we had RFID to, to determine the position on the track. So for instance, here you can see that we map this RFID card to the cow this one to the car, this one to the station, and this one to the crossing. So that way we can see where the train is going on the track. Uh, next that we had a camera, because, I mean, you need some live video streaming, especially if you're at your work, of course, again, during lunch breaks, um, and you're running around with the train, and if you cannot see anything, it's not really a lot of fun. So we attach a, a camera on the train, and that's actually streaming full HD video, but video is a bit tricky to make it uh, running smoothly without a delay um, and then for like web applications I mean there are some solutions to use VLC or something like that to stream the video but with a Raspberry Pi it's a bit tricky to do that M most of the time you have a delay of like three seconds and then the train is already at the other end of the track so that's not, that's not really cool um, but I found a solution uh, if you ever want to do anything with Raspberry Pi cameras have a look at this program what it does, it, it just takes images and refreshes images really quickly. And that's a lot better performing than doing streaming video. And the end result, you cannot really see the difference that it's live streaming or just refreshing pictures. So that's a, a nice solution to work with. And we also have an overview camera because, I mean, if your train crashes and you're not there, then you need to see what's going on. Um, next to that, we also automated switches uh, so that we could change from tracks. And we did that with using powerful servos that more or less just bend the switch so that it goes straight or makes a bend. And these paper clips are probably the most expensive ones in the world um, because you have to make them like millimeter perfect because else it doesn't work. So we had with four colleagues spent like half a day making four paper clips, which was a bit of a hassle and less fun. Um, but in the end it worked and we could just use it without having to modify something because I also saw some solutions where people started drilling in the switches to make them switch easier. But then if you post that on a Lego form, you get dead threads and, and stuff like that. So we're like, maybe that's not a good solution. Let's just keep the Lego complete without fiddling with it. Um, if you want to do something with servos, you need like a servo board for the Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi can only control like one servo at a time. And with the servo board, you can control up to 11. And you need a power adapter because these servos consume quite a lot of power. But then you're you're good to go. Um, after trains, I mean, trains were already cool, but I was like, okay, I saw a Ferris wheel that was even cooler. And I was like, okay, let's see if we can also connect to that and use that one in our setup. And it actually, in the end, I found out, okay, it's, it's just if the same infrared receiver that I can connect to it. So I could use exactly the same software I was using to control a train to control the Ferris wheel. So that's actually quite nice of Lego that they made a system with different engines but with the same receiver and the same battery packs and everything. So you can just reuse your stuff. And that way it's really easy to also use a Ferris wheel. Um, but if you do something with IoT, it's, it's more or less mandatory to do something with LEDs, isn't it? I mean, you need LEDs, then it looks fancy and it's even cooler. So we're like, okay, how can we fit in some LEDs within our setup with trains and Ferris wheels and everything. And then I thought, okay, maybe we can use it to display the speed the Ferris wheel is traveling at or the speed the trains are traveling at. Um, so you can see one here in front, the LED strip. It's later with the demo, I will show you that it will display the speed of the two trains that are moving. 
And for the Ferris wheel, we use this LED ring to display the speed. So you can see here three LEDs with a different color. So it's now moving at speed three. Um, the nice thing here is this is a particle photon. It, it doesn't run Java, unfortunately, but it's a really cool device, a bit Arduino-like, but then with a Wi-Fi chip on board for only 21 bucks. And it's a really nice thing because if you get it out of the box, you just connect to it with your mobile phone, you enter your router credentials, and then it automatically connects to the cloud of the vendor. And that cloud is not only to send commands, but as you can see here, uh, there's also an IDE inside the cloud. So you basically, you just write your code, you compile it and everything, and then you can send it to one of the particle photons. By the way, I didn't choose these names, they're auto-generated. Um, so then you can just say, okay, I want to put this, uh, this application on this photon, and then just publish it. And then you can just do REST calls through the cloud to the photon, and then, for instance, control LEDs. Um, we made it a bit different because Using the cloud at a conference is always uh, a bit tricky. You cannot really rely on the internet connection. So we set up a local cloud for it, which was quite a lot of work on our laptop. But they now have firmwares that make it really easy. You can just flash the photon and then just use them directly. So if you ever want to play with something really small, I mean, the photon is this, this little thing here. So it's, it's really compact. It's uh, a nice toy to play with. I can really recommend it. Um, but of course, you're all waiting for a demo to see if something is failing. So let's see if we can start up something. So now you see three LED LEDs uh, in red, so that indicates trains moving at speed three. Now it's moving at speed four. If we reverse it, it will go the other direction. So that way we can easily show the, the train speed. And we can do it with two trains at the same time. So now there are also some blue LEDs. They indicate the blue train. So you can just run around. Uh, I forgot to ena enable something. Let's wait a second till the train is here. Because we also, oh, of course, want to have some sound with it. So here we can just select any song that's, the songs are basically on the Raspberry Pi and we just use MPEG 1, 2, 3 of, of Linux to play any song that you want. Makes it a lot cooler and it's really handy because if you're, again, at, at work and you see somebody breaking into your home, you can play songs on the train, will probably scare them away quite easily. But maybe then you need uh, a bit other other sounds like uh, I don't know what we have here. Uh, something like this will probably work better when you want to scare somebody away. Um, next to that, when we look at the blue train at the bottom here, we see now that it is displaying cow. So that's the, the the position of the train, and hopefully now it will display something else. Mm. It's a bit tricky. Ah, now, now it displays car, so the last position was the car. It's a bit tricky because oh, now it displays bicycle, which is this position. But it's a bit tricky with RFID. I don't know if you have them here in, in England, but in Holland we have like the same RFID system to check in to public transport. And if you want to check in and you move a bit too quickly with your cart or the distance is too far, then it won't be picked up. And it's the same for this solution. Uh, so it's a really cheap solution, but it's not really reliable, only when you travel at a uh, low speed. Uh, but it's a nice way to toy around a bit. Um, because what we can do is use it in autopilot and then say, based on the location of the blue train, because the blue train is the only one that has RFID, we can make the white train do stuff. So let's enter just some commands. Let it stop. That's also a nice one. Uh, let's see. Go. And we can just send those commands, basically. Uh, wait a second.
So the train, uh, the the blue train is now. Uh, the blue train is at the bicycle location, and here we specify that then the white train should move backwards at speed three. If we now start moving the blue train, uh, okay. So we the blue train was at the cow, so the white train stopped. Uh, didn't pick up the crossing, I think this time. So bicycle, so white train starts moving again. Yeah, it doesn't like the crossing apparently, but something has to go wrong during a demo, so I mean, we achieved that. So that way we can easily just do some magic with the trains and, and make it run around. Uh, another thing we could do is just send like a list of commands to the train and it will just play these commands. So it will drive for three seconds at three speed, at speed three, then at three seconds it stands still and then it plays a song. So these commands are then just sent to the train and are executed independently of the laptop. So even if I shut down the laptop, the commands will just keep on running the train. So that's most of the, yeah, we also have an overview camera. So this is like a live full HD stream of the camera here. It's a bit dark in here, so it's not so clear the image, but if you have like a, a bit light in the room, then it's a really clear picture of it. And we can control the LEDs, we can do other stuff with it as well. So we can also display like standard animation or um, make it annoyingly bright. But let's not do that because you probably don't like that. Um, okay, so that's more or less the, the functionality of our trains. Uh, we also had some challenges. Um, it isn't my house, but I burned down a Raspberry Pi by connecting it to the wrong ports with an adapter, which apparently don't they don't like really much. Um, also crashed some Raspberry Pis because the pins inside the USB port are a bit uh, different on the new A Plus model. So if you insert a USB device, uh, the pins are bent backwards, and more or less that's the end of your Raspberry Pi. So we actually had quite a lot of challenges also to find proper documentation and to find tools to be able to do this. Like the infrared protocol LEGO is using for the trains is a proprietary protocol, which is a bit difficult. But luckily somebody wrote the C script for it and got a bit of help from him to get it up and running for the train. So it takes a bit of time to get everything working. But in the end, I think yeah, we had a nice solution. It, it took quite some time. I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge is time. Uh, just being able to set everything up and get it up and running because every time you find some new issue, like we had the issue that an SD card wasn't properly inserted in the Raspberry Pi and that's only like a millimeter difference. So you don't really notice that until you had the issue before and then the next time you first check if the SD card is in. So there are lots of small things that will cost you a lot of time to set it up, but it has been a fun hobby project. And we got some help from the Lego dudes. And now it's up to my colleague for the rest of the show. All right. Hi. Enough about trains. Let's see some code. Our manager actually pays us to do this. So he, uh, he's not, he was not super excited about it when we t started talking about trains and Lego. And we said, can we do it during work hours? He was a bit skeptic. Uh, one of the big reasons why we can do it is so we can come to conference and talk about it. It's also used as a, as a recruitment tool. And lastly, but not least, we can use some new technology on our Raspberry Pis. And one of the, those technologies was Akka. I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Akka. Who, who knows Akka? Show hands. Who has ever coded an actor? All right, a couple of people, great. Um, so Akka, yeah, we wanted to try it out on our train set, of course. And uh, we have some uh, momentum going there with customers and developers that are excited about Akka. And we thought we need a project to display, display a bit how it works, make it easy to talk about, as Johan uh, explained earlier. So what is Akka? This, this is mountain range. Does anyone, anyone know it? We were in Stockholm last two weeks ago <laughs> in Sweden, and no one else knew it either. But Akka is actually this mountain range in, in, in Sweden. Uh, Akka is also an actor-based, message-based system to develop distributed and uh, highly scalable applications. That's a whole mouthful, but um, 
we thought to show it through an example, which is our train set. So we switched around our, our topology a bit about the trains. Um, we stopped using a lot of uh, REST APIs to talk between the different, uh, different pies, and we re-implemented all that technology in Akka actors, and it looks a bit like this. So this is the same picture as Johan showed you earlier, except with added more actors, a bit corny, but there they go. And um, we replaced a few REST APIs. So these components all talked through REST APIs before. Uh, of course, the Angular API of Angular still talks to the backend through a, through a REST API, but this now is all uh, actor-based communication with Akka. And a, a bit how that works is, uh, in Akka, you, you program an actor, and an actor receives, can receive messages from, for example, other actors. And these messages uh, are sent, and they have to be uh, serializable. So that means the, the message cannot have active, uh, it cannot be an object, pretty much. So it, it, it has to be serializable, just as a REST uh, message. Um, but that has an, uh, an advantage. The dense, you can send those messages across JVMs. You, don't, you can reuse your actors in different JVMs. That's called uh, Akka remote actors. And we used remote actors on the switch control and the device control to, to call from the LTCC application. Uh, and we thought that was pretty cool. So I promised you some code, so here we go. The top part is uh, a super, super simple actor uh, definition. So uh, it's a coordinator and it extends actor. And that's what you have to do if you want to implement an actor. And then you can implement the receive method, which is basically uh, how to receive a message from a different part of the system. In this case, it doesn't do much. It can receive only one type of message, and when it gets it, it will print it. So there we go. That's the most simple actor I, I could think of. Um, now, to call that actor, to actually send it a message from a different part, you have to need, need an actor system. So that's the bottom part of the code. Um, the first line is uh, creating, the, uh, creating the actor system, and then after that, we, cre we create a reference to the actor, and then the bottom part is calling the actor and sending it a message. And this example is of not of a remote actor, but of a local actor, which means you can have multiple actors in your same JVM and then send messages across. But we wanted to use remote actors, and that's actually pretty similar, and that's the, one of the strengths of Akka. Um, it doesn't really matter if your actor is local or remote. There's only one small change to make, and that's the following change. So the top part is, again, getting the reference to an actor when it's local and then calling it. The bottom part is the same thing, but for a remote actor, which is pretty much just point to where the system lives on the network, and then you get the same reference, and you can use that actor reference in the same way as you can a local reference, which makes it very easy and quick to change the, your configuration of your application, change where actors live, and call them in different JVMs on, across the network. So that's what we did with the train set. There's one catch. You'll have to configure your Akka setup to actually work with remote actors. Um, <coughs> we used Akka, if we used it across TCP. There's also an option to use UDP if you want, uh, the enable transports part. Um, and of course the port, you can pick any port you like. You can even fill in zero, but then it'll pick a random port for you, where, where, and then you'll have to find out what port that is to use it. So just pick a port you want to know. So why, why, would, we, why would we even want to use this instead of just REST APIs to talk? I mean, why would we want to do that? Uh, and that was one of the things we wanted to find out. Um, and um, one of the very obvious reasons is that it's more natural programming. Just calling your actor or a remote actor is a much more natural way of programming than actually creating uh, a client for your REST API and then using that. And the other thing is that if you use a REST API, you'll have to do probably do some marshalling of JSON or, or XML or SOAP things. And that'll just create a bunch of random uh, boilerplate code that you really don't want to write. If you have an actor, you can just well, as in the example I showed you, you can just bang it and send it a message, and that's it. And the Akka figures out where that actor lives and figures out how to, how to get the message to it. So it's a, a lot more less boilerplate code and a lot more deployment flexibility. But using uh, REST or using HTTP, of course, 
you don't have you're not stuck on the JVM. Akka is a JVM, and there is an implementation for .NET as well. Uh, you can run it in Mono or in .NET, Akka.NET, but not in GoLang or not in, on, on Node.js or anything. So a REST API is a lot more flexible that way. You can implement your service in any language you want, and now we're stuck. With Akka, we're stuck in the JVM pretty much. That and that makes uh, it makes for a much more loosely coupled system. So REST API. Uh, is a little bit more loosely coupled than using Akka implementations. But those things are very, very, very hard to measure. They, these are advantages to, to either sides that are, uh, well, very hard to measure. And we thought, are there any advantages we can actually measure, truly measure? And one of them would be the size of your program. So what do all the dependencies for Akka and REST uh, actually increase the size of your FET jar? So we measured that, made a super simple application in, in a couple of different technologies, a super simple service. Uh, using a local actor, uh, we had just included the, the basic Akka uh, libraries, which was around seven or eight MBs. Adding the remote actor libraries increased that by about three, so it's not too big either. Using the Akka HTTP, HTTP stack, which is um, the Akka implementation of actor-friendly REST clients and REST, uh, AP, REST services, um, that bumped it up considerably to 21. And just using Spring Boot, uh, I'm sure you know Spring Boot, to create a REST service was around 13 MB. So that's that's about the, 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 the if that's a problem for you, if you have to keep your packages small because you have to run them on Pi Zeros or something, then uh, that might be an issue. Plus, we could measure this. Another thing we wanted to measure was the performance of the of the services. So we wanted to test the performances of an ACA. Uh, transport uh, against like hardcore HTTP transports, and we used Gatling. Anyone heard of Gatling before for performance testing? Show hands. Well, a couple of couple. Of. I I would say test it out. Gatling.io. It's a lot less complicated than, uh, for instance, JMeter to set up uh, performance testing. Um, yeah, well, I can show you more code. This is a. Uh, Scala, Scala code to set up a super simple uh, test in Gatling. Uh, what we want to do here is uh, run a scenario which uh, actually ping, uh, calls the ping service, on this, in this case on localhost port 8080, and check if the status it gets returned is 200. So it's a pretty basic test of, of, of a service. Uh, after that, uh, we, you can pause, we pause 100 milliseconds and then retry, do it again, do it again. And our, to use that scenario, we set up uh, a system that uh, simulates 1,000 users over 10 seconds, which means it starts with zero users and then slowly ramps it up to a, up to 1,000 users. So that's 1,000 users calling uh, that service 10 times, oh no, or, well, about 10 times a second. And this is it. This is all you need to, for Gatling to set this up. If you run this, then you'll probably DDoS your service. So that we thought it was super simple to do. So we so we tried it. This was our test setup. So we got Gatling on the left, and these are two, uh, two instances of tests, one with Akka HTTP and one with, um, as a backend, and, and one with Akka remote actors as a backend. So what's going on here? We have Gatling calling one service on a JVM1. That runs HTTP, is an HTTP service. And that calls a backend ser service on another JVM. Uh, and the top part is calling the backend service through Akka HTTP. And the bottom part is calling the service through Akka remote actors. And then, of course, the response gets marshaled back, back to, the, to, the, to the Gatling. So we did that. And these were our results. So that's pretty impressive, we thought. So we tried with 40, uh, 50 uh, users. We tried with 50 users without a pause in between. So that's, uh, so here, these are no pause. So that's not with a 100 millisecond pause. So as soon as it gets its return, it just fires another request. F 500 users and 1,000 users. So here you can see that uh, across HTTP uh, is, is a, well, quite a bit slower. These are mean times, so they're, they're averages. Um, no, it's quite a big difference. But that's not all you would want to know, because uh, we also tested the max response times. And 
There you can see there's even a bigger difference. There's a, for some reason, the thousand without a pause is uh, slower than a thousand. Well, thousand with pause is slower than a thousand without a pause. But so you see both ramp up, but um, HTTP is, is in this example quite a bit slower. One uh, way to look at uh, performance statistics is usually to use the 99 percentile, which basically means 99 percent of the requests were in this time period, and one percent was uh, a little slower. So it's a good way to you know, to get to get a good number. So on that bombshell, my colleague said, "No way, we're doing REST anymore. We're going to do actors all the way." This is his quote: "REST is dead. Long live remote actors." But this is not 100% fair, because we used uh, the Akka HTTP library, which is an actor-friendly way to do HTTP uh, REST, uh, REST uh, requests. And we wanted to try something else that was fairly largely used in the industry, which is uh, Spring. So Spring services. If we use Spring services, do we get the same numbers? So we tried that. In that case, it's not all happy for the, for the, for the remote actor part. So these numbers are fairly equal, and Spring is faster in most instances. So this is remote actors uh, versus Spring, and in this case, uh, Spring is pretty fast. Who would have thought? But when we look at the maximum response times, you can see that Spring is also a lot less dodgy in, 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 its, in its return. So uh, actually, at least one request was almost a second, where uh, actors was a lot more stable. We see that when we do the 99% thing, we see the same result. So I'm not trying to tell you that you should always use actors for remote, remote services, but uh, we thought this was a measurable thing that we could do and try and test, and we wanted to share you the results. Somehow, the remote actors uh, with 500 users with pause took quite a long time in this example. Uh, we have no explanation for that, but we didn't want to fake the results. We did every test three times and averaged, so probably one of the tests went, I don't know, hit a, hit a snare somewhere, but, uh, well, you can fake your own results if you have any. This, this, these are ours. We have, no, uh, we have no explanation for that. One interesting other thing is that the no pause uh, uh, tests for 50 users are actually faster than the uh, with pause. We don't have any explanation for that either. Maybe it's because some parts are kept in memory with it without the pause. It's faster retries. But uh, well, again, these are our results. So what do we do, want to do in the future with, with our train set? Well, we have a lot of things we want to do. We are our own product owner for this, this particular project. So one of our, my colleagues is uh, writing, for example, Reactive Pi, which is a library uh, that actually implements actors to directly call the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pis, which is very interesting. Reactive Pi, look them up. Uh, it's, not, it's not finished yet, but it's, you can, it's usable, and you can run it on the Pi, and then it'll uh, skip you having to directly call C or Python uh, from, uh, from, from Java. So you can just directly use an actor, send a message to that actor, say, hey, give me the readout from, from GPIO port 11, and then you get your result back. Um, other things we want to do, uh, we want to, of course, uh, make more smart trains, so more RFID spots and make them actually maybe some pathfinding things. Uh, we want to use the camera better, so we want to do uh, uh, automatic recharging. At this point, we have a three-hour battery life in our trains. <coughs> uh, we can do the wireless recharging things with the induction uh, coils, but we have no precision to actually stop the train right on the top of the coil. So. At this point, we only have the RFID for positioning, and as you saw in the demo, it's flaky at best. So we're still looking for ways to do that. If anyone has an idea, make sure to come up and, and explain. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's sort of the future of our project, project. And to sum it up, we really like this project. There are about four guys working on it, but there are tons of people with us that, that uh, that did help. Um, we want to. I just want to say that you should have this at your company. You have some kind of play project, and you can work on it off hours. Maybe you can convince your manager to use it as a recruitment tool or whatever, and actually get paid to work on it. 
uh, maybe you can try out new technologies and speak at conferences for it. It got us here, uh, for instance. And um, we get to play with trains like kids. We get to talk about Akka like grown-ups. We get to play with Java and Akka and Scala and Internet of Things. And the best part is, of course, you've seen it. The ones that were early, you get to have your trains get you beer. That's the excellent part. And that's the end of that. Any questions? Yes. All right, one moment. I have another, uh, another mic. I have to turn it on. Sorry, who, was, who had the questions? I can shout if you like. All right, I'll re just repeat the question. Bring it. Okay, um, so what is interesting to me sort of in the Internet of Things, um, you spoke about uh, introducing the device into your mobile phone. Mm -hmm. The photon, yeah, you can, you can program the photon using a, a mobile phone. Or So your question is basically that, uh, can I use Akka to maybe help me with bootstrapping my devices and in, in, initializing the devices? I wouldn't say that Akka was a, the best tool for this. Uh, maybe my colleague has any ideas about that. Um, yeah, when you use Akka, you can, for instance, do clustering. And then um, if you start a new node in the cluster, you can make that node more or less send a message to the central control center like, hey, here I am. Um, and that way you could just hook up new nodes in the cluster um, without having to statically program them beforehand. So you don't need any fixed IP addresses beforehand. You can just do it uh, while adding the nodes. So there, there is some support in, in that region. Uh, um, but still, then you need to set, set up a few nodes that are already there so the other nodes can connect to those. So there's always a bit of preparation that you need. But if you have that bit of preparation, then it's actually quite easy to add extra nodes. Um, but then you have to need you need to do a bit of more of programming because then you need to add those IP addresses to some list or whatever to make sure you keep control of them and track them. And um, for instance, our trains they have different capabilities. One has a camera, the other one hasn't got a camera. So then, from the node that you're adding, you need to send like a message to the central station, uh, central control center. Uh, stating what capabilities you have and stuff like that. So you have to do a mo bit more communication to set up everything, but then it's a bit easier. You don't have to do it statically. So it's just what you want. If you have a few nodes, then maybe statically is just easier. If you have lots of nodes, then probably it's easier to program a bit more and make it dynamically uh, addable. Is this mobile? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, Akka, is, Akka is from JVM off, yeah. so, so, so it's got bootstrapping. Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, you wanted to know uh, how we identify the capabilities of the different trains. Um, we, we made it quite easy for ourselves and just made like a configuration file with every train inside it. It's just JSON configuration like the configuration you saw to configure remote actors. There's just a little bit of uh, configuration for our application that says there are, there's a list of trains, and train one has these capabilities, train two has these capabilities. So f for a few devices, that's probably the easiest way to set it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with REST, it's reasonably easy to switch to TLS security if you want to know HTTPS. Can you do the same latter with your actors? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the question is, how can you basically easily set up SSL or other encryption standards for Akka? Uh, that again, you can do that in the configuration file we showed you. You can just configure everything in there, so you can enable SSL. Um, also, when you normally have Akka, you can send like poison pills to destroy like an actor. Uh, you can also configure the actor system uh, that it doesn't allow that. So you can specify every. Uh, configuration for security that you want in, in this file, basically. Which is your application.com store. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you said that um, there's, you don't have to do the kind of marshalling and unmarshalling and uh, mm -hmm. so forth, um, JSON or whatever. Do you, do you get things like versioning of APIs? Do you get things like type, type safety? Yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, if you don't do marshalling and everything, uh, uh, how do you get type safety? Um, 
the, the example we showed you was just sending a string around. So that's something you shouldn't do. That's horrible. Um, you should use, in Scala, for instance, case classes or see it a bit as objects in, in Java where you just say, OK, I have a train object. And in the train object, I have a few properties. And, and that's my message that I'm sending around. And uh, if you have a new message, you yeah, you could even version them by just giving the object uh, a version name or something like that. So yeah, you can still version it because uh, you need to know the object at both ends. So at the actor that is sending the request and the actor that is receiving the request, they have to know the same object because else you cannot communicate. Uh, so with Akka, you can do uh, message duct typing. So you can actually just check if the message has certain properties and then work with that. So that makes it a bit more loose. Uh, so you can just check if your message has a certain property and then work on that. So that's the way that Akka makes it not that you have to share the exact type of message and still uh, distribute your message definitions across all actors. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, the question is, if there is there any kind of support for dynamic code replacement in Akka? Is what you're asking, right? Yeah, um, I'm actually not sure. I don't. I don't think there is. I think you're going to have to re replace the jar on the device if you want to replace the the code. Is that a sufficient answer for you? Of course. If you, but I'm not sure if Akka has any uh, support for that. Sorry. All right. I see that our time is pretty much nearly up, so I'll just end, end the session for now. You can come walk up and see the trains for a couple of minutes, and then we'll have to clean it up. Thank you very much. Thank you.